Now, uh, finally, that brings me to the uh, wrap-up session of uh, this two-day program. I think we're quite uh, lucky to have as our uh, wrap-up speaker, David Mullen. Uh, Dave didn't want to be introduced, and so in uh, the expeditious, uh, an attempt to be expeditious, uh, I'll say this finally. Um, let me say quite simply, Dave, Dave has uh, had a distinguished career as a law teacher in a number of law schools in Canada and abroad. I think it's generally acknowledged that he's one of the leading administrative law lawyers or administrative law academics, and I, th I think you can equate them in this country, and it gives me a great deal of ple pleasure to ask him to uh, present the wrap-up speech. At uh, Bacchanalian orgies in ancient Rome, there was always an orator present. And the reason for his presence was just in case at the end of the normal festivities, people had not had an excess of enjoyment. He, and I use the word advisedly, was there to declaim. And I must say that I feel much in that capacity this afternoon. The only difference, of course, between me and the orator is the fact that the orator was absolutely prohibited from participating in the proceedings of the orgy. He waited in the wings. Unfortunately, I have been here today and I feel sated as well, but sated in a most enjoyable manner. And the organizers of this conference are to be commended for uh, putting together uh, a wonderful program. Uh, the only gap in the program that I noticed uh, was in fact that there was not going to be an after dinner speaker last evening for those of us who were fortunate enough to enjoy the hospitality of the Law Society of Upper Canada, the speakers and the commentators. My assumption all along, however, was that that was a spot that had been specially reserved for Phil Annisman to give us part three of Cuddy Chicks. <laughs> in fact, I want to assure you, those of you who were not at the dinner last night that Phil, in fact, did not give part three of Cuddy Chicks, but I imagine it is scheduled very shortly. <laughs> at 4.15. No, no, at 10.2. Um, at the beginning of my paper, and I, I don't intend to, to speak to it all that directly this afternoon, uh, because much of what I say in that paper has already been said in the course of a lot of commentary over the last two days. Uh, I quote from John Willis, who has been referred to both orally and in a number of the written presentations. Uh, and of course, as we all know, John is, is, is almost certainly Canada's most distinguished academic administrative lawyer. And the point that I quote John on uh, is the point of the principle of uniqueness is the principle for me. And it seemed to me that in terms of the title to this particular series of lectures, principle, practice, and pluralism, that in fact John in that particular statement which he made in relation to the Ontario Statutory Powers Procedure Act, or the proposal of McCrua for such a piece of legislation, in fact captures at least two of the things that we're talking about or have been talking about over these last two days. The great difficulty that as administrative lawyers we have in encompassing the incredibly broad range of decision making uh, that tribunals, boards and agencies engage in within some common threads of principle. And uh, that I think has remained our dilemma in the 23 or 24 years since John Willis uttered that statement. In my paper, what I speak to in relation to that statement is the Statutory Powers Procedure Act itself, a piece of legislation that has been referred to on a number of occasions in the course of the last two days. Quite clearly, uh, the most significant, or at least the most optically visible part of that particular legislation is the part in which the procedural rules are actually described. And what we all know, of course, from a reading of those procedural rules is that they follow very much an adjudicative judicial style model. And it was that imposition of an adjudicative judicial style model on tribunals that John Willis was particularly concerned about. 
Let me say, however, that despite Willis's concerns, there were, to my way of thinking, a number of redeeming things with the Statutory Powers Procedure Act. First of all, uh, at the same time that the legislation was enacted, many, many tribunals were having their own legislation amended to make it clear as to the extent to which the Act applied to them. In other words, there was a fairly careful attempt to calibrate the needs of particular tribunals uh, to the provisions of the Statutory Powers Procedure Act. So it was not an undifferentiated standard that was being applied across the board of Ontario decision-making bodies. Secondly, uh, and it is this point that I want to rely upon or speak to most, secondly, in the Statutory Powers Procedure Act itself, there was provision for a body called the Statutory Powers Procedure Rules Committee, a body which until this morning I thought had actually gone out of existence until John Evans told me that he's on it and something actually happened last week for the first time in a long, long time. What I want to suggest is that in that Statutory Powers Procedure Rules Committee, one has the genesis of something that I think is probably badly needed today in the whole area of administrative law in the province of Ontario. Now, I don't pretend that I'm making a novel suggestion in this regard because quite clearly the concept of a council on administrative agencies is something that other uh, people have recommended and most notably and I suppose most recently uh, Bob McCauley in his, in his report directions. But it did seem to me that in its initial conception and I think McCrure is to be praised for this, was a recognition that the Statutory Powers Procedure Rules Committee could serve as a monitoring agent, a way in which the rules of individual administrative tribunals and decision makers could be tailored to meet the circumstances of the individual matters that they had to adjudicate. And I think it is to the discredit of successive governments that that body never received the financial and staffing support that it so obviously deserved. Now, I think we must also acknowledge that the Statutory Powers Procedure Act has in many other respects become out of date. It does not, for example, recognise, as Hudson Janish quite uh, vividly pointed out this morning, it does not recognise the potential, the possibility, the capability of administrative tribunals to engage in rulemaking procedures. It makes no provision at all, except in one very minor respect with respect to notice, it makes no provision at all with respect to those kinds of things that administrative tribunals all over the province now regularly engage in, that is pre-hearing devices of various kinds with a view to making their procedures that much more efficient and that much more effective. But I would have thought that it should be very high on the legislative agenda of the Attorney General's Department and of this province generally to engage in the kind of reform uh, that would first of all lead to the creation of a council on administrative agencies or administrative tribunals to fulfil the monitoring agent role that the Statutory Powers Procedure Act promised but never delivered and that brought the Statutory Powers Procedure Act up to date in a flexible environment providing for things such as rulemaking and the like. The other point that I uh, address in my paper and that uh, I want to, to speak to very briefly before finishing today is the whole question of flexibility in terms of flexibility of procedures as they emerge from court decisions. Uh, Martin Lachlan, who is the other text that I, I introduced my paper with, doubted that after Nix Nick Nicholson that the courts in Canada would in fact have the capacity to engage in the flexible imposition of common law standards of procedural fairness that Nicholson seemed to demand. And I think at best the record of the courts in fulfilling the philosophy of Nicholson in this particular regard has been extremely mixed. And we've heard a lot about the extremely mixed nature of the court's response to procedural fairness demands over the last couple of days. And one quick way, and I, I rewrote this thing or reconceived it on a number of occasions as the speeches went on through the last two days, one way it seemed to me that we might in a quick summary form get some sense of the damage, if you like, that the court has done, or the uncertainty that the court, and I think notably the Supreme Court, has left this whole area of the law in, is if we focus on a concept that I refer to in my paper as labelling. We use labels all the time in law, but what it seems to me has happened in the area of administrative law in particular and process, uh, sorry, administrative law in general and process in particular, is that we have tended to use labels not as an indicator or a factor or a criterion, but as excluders or includers. 
And I think we have got into a lot of problems because of the absolute terms in which we have dealt with or perceived of various labels. Oftentimes, the labels that have been used have been overbroad. On other occasions, they have not been responsive to the real issues that are at stake in the particular piece of legislation. Other times, they're being used in a manner that is quite different to the ordinary colloquial meaning of the language that normal people would assume that meaning had. And I think, most importantly, in some instances, the labels that we've tended to use in administrative law have been labels that, in many instances, have masked value judgments of a very important kind. And I want to refer very briefly to seven, most of which have emerged during the course uh, of, of the last couple of days. One that I had not originally thought about talking about, but Howard Wetston uh, dramatically made the point yesterday, was the whole question of the label, is it criminal or is it a public welfare regulatory offence? And this obviously a distinction that the Supreme Court of Canada has been trading in for the purposes of strict liability offences and administrative law, trading in for the purposes of the search and seizure powers of administrative agencies. Howard was great. What did he say? I'll take the label. I know I do criminal law, but I'll take the label that I am in fact doing public welfare regulatory offence stuff. And it seems to me that you know, when we've got a body of jurisprudence that depends upon that kind of labelling, uh, you know, we potentially have some very real problems. In fact, as Howard spoke, it, it reminded me very much of, 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 of the late Joe Orton's play Loot, which was made into a movie. In Loot, uh, one of the things that happened was that there was the investigation of a murder going on throughout the play. And the police were, as I recollect it, were rather, rather worried about how they would get the evidence. Well, the police inspector came up with the very obvious device of getting the evidence of being able to search, seize, dig, demolish property and the like. He posed as a health board inspector and there were no problems there afterwards. <laughs> the English accepted from the health board inspector what they would not expect from the police. And I think Howard Wetston is in fact uh, you know, telling us that, that, that same thing in relation to the competition tribunal. Enough of that. Uh, Another excluded we have used uh, in administrative law, and I've railed against this on many occasions in the past, is the excluded that if it is a legislative function, we have no business imposing procedures on the particular tribunal and as, or the particular decision maker. And as Hudson has dramatically pointed out in his presentation, what has that led to? It's led to the complete unwillingness of the courts in, in Canada to consider in any manner or other the imposition of rulemaking hearings. It's now getting in the way of the development of, it seems to me, a sensible, sensitive doctrine of legitimate expectation. Uh, the one, of course, that has surfaced uh, most dramatically here, uh, and particularly today, is, of course, the, uh, uh, the consolidated Bathurst Tremblay. Uh, excluder, includer. Is it compulsion or is it influence? And everybody is saying, how do we sort compulsion versus influence out? And undoubtedly, it's, it's extremely problematic. Let me be completely heretical and say what Ron Ellis was, I think, not prepared to say, uh, and I can say it and perhaps he can't. I have no problem with compulsion in certain situations. It seems to me that the chair in certain situations should be able to dictate the result in a particular case and to keep uh, control of an administrative tribunal uh, in a mass adjudication situ situation where there is need for consistency and coherence in the, in the judgments of that particular tribunal. It's not every case, of course, that compulsion is something that should be acceptable or should be tolerated. But I think saying you can never have compulsion excludes the possibility that a pluralist administrative law system should be willing to contemplate. Uh, Mr. Justice Reid, or the Honourable, Mr. Uh, the Honourable Robert Reid, in the course of his presentation, points to another one, and he did it dramatically: amenable to persuasion or a closed mind. I mean, at least Mr. Justice Lafarey got that one right, and he said all that's going to lead to is a lot of posturing. I think we should admit in certain municipal corporation situations that closed minds are a reality. People have been elected and people expect them to have a closed mind on that issue that they're being put into power for. So, I, you know, once again, by you know, turning it, in, in the case that cried for innovation, turning it into if you've got a closed mind, you're disqualified but not otherwise, uh, seems to me to be, uh, to be rather unrealistic and, and to lead to situations where we're once again excluded. Incidentally, Mr Justice Corrie, 
in the Newfoundland Telephone Company case saying to this fellow Wells, hey listen, before the hearing is scheduled you can yell and scream and give public interviews and damn the telephone company and damn everyone, but the moment the hearing has started you've got to behave yourself, seems to me to be in some senses leading to uh, the ultimate in hypocrisy in terms of people who are selected for a particular uh, task on an administrative tribunal. Okay, uh, Phil, I can't leave Phil out of this. Uh, oh, please. The, the other one, uh, the other excluder, though it's not perhaps really an excluder, as, as Phil told us, is you, know, you can decide charter issues perhaps only if, but perhaps not, if you've got the ability to deal with matters of law and fact arising before you. But then, of course, if you've got that formula, and this came out of the Ontario Court of Appeal and seems to have been followed through in the Supreme Court of Canada. If you've got that formula, not only can you do it, you've got to do it. And it seems to me that that kind of absolute solution to the whole question of, of whether or not uh, one deals with charter, a tribunal deals with charter issues or not uh, is, uh, is extremely problematic. Uh, and I'll just mention two others in passing. Uh, the whole public-private uh, distinction that is uh, that the bedevils not only constitutional law but also administrative law seems to me to be becoming more and more problematic as well. Madam Justice De Desjardins referred to uh, the extent to which the English courts are now beginning to see uh, the possibility of, of, of certain uh, you know, pri so-called private organisations with a huge public impact as being potentially subject to the remedies of judicial review. We're beginning to have that debate in Canada, not quite in that context, though the Hutterite case that Barb McIsaac referred to this morning I think has echoes of this. But the context in which we're beginning to have some difficulty with, with this kind of question in Canada is in the whole area of government procurement contracts. And this summer, out of the British Columbia uh, Supreme Court, Mr. Justice Vickers, we have two decisions to the effect that this is private activity, it should be subject to the private law of contract, exclude the possibility of the principles of administrative public law. And so, you know, at a lower court level in, in, in Canada, we're seeing yet another excluder entering in, excluder in its absolute sense. Uh, and then there's the one that I won't get into at all, governmental action and non-governmental action for the purposes of the Charter. But one. I assume that everyone knows enough about that or has heard enough about that already. Well, all of this seems to me, uh, at least from the point of view of what the Supreme Court of Canada is doing to us, uh, to confirm the kind of pessimism uh, that, uh, that, that Bob Reed referred to in the, in, in the course of, of his lecture. And I guess I, I have some obligation uh, in the three minutes remaining to me to inject something of a note of, uh, of optimism into a conference that in fact has been uh, uh, such a success and has, been, has brought together uh, such a fine bunch of people. And, you know, it's very funny. Uh, Margot Priest talks about the tribunal from hell and, uh, and, and her description is horrendous uh, in terms of some of the things that tribunals have to put up with and one has a considerable degree of sympathy uh, for the situation under which our tribunals uh, are operating in this province and presumably all across Canada. The very encouraging thing it seems to me in all of this is that while she, first of all, that she can actually publicly speak in a forum like this about the tribunal from hell being a member of one of those tribunals in itself says something. The other thing that says something that I think is particularly important and particularly significant and we've been talking, a number of us have been talking about this over the last couple of days, is who is here? Who is at this conference? Who has been involved over the last few years in trying to establish on a volunteer, part-time, overload basis, a learning process, an attempt to professionalise the tribunals of this particular province? It's the members of tribunals. And so they may feel like they're in hell, but at least as far as we're concerned, looking at this from the outside, it is incredibly encouraging to see the extent to which appointments to administrative tribunals in this province uh, over, I think, at, at least the last two governments have actually encouraged this degree of wanting to learn, willingness to experiment, willingness to go out, to reach out, to try and lobby for resources. And I think, you know, if we really want to know something about all of this, the tribunal from hell in many instances, if not in all instances, actually deserves the deference that I heard Andy a bit reluctantly say yesterday, I don't think so. I think that you know, we are well served within an era of incredible restraint 
in terms of the tribunal system that we have in this particular province. And that well-servedness, I think, deserves a more favorable judicial response, uh, as Mr. Justice Blair advocated. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, David. Um, I, I think uh, we're now at a point where we are on schedule for the conclusion of of this uh, series of special lectures, th thanks to David abbreviating his speech and not once saying finally. Um, I have only a few words to say, and, and, and I will be brief. <laughs> I'd like to say uh, before closing uh, the special lectures this year, on behalf of both Dennis O'Connor and myself, uh, who co-chaired them, uh, that we're both, uh, we both want to express our thanks to all of the people who contributed to making this special lectures what they were. Uh, and let me just enunciate them with a lot of footnotes, of course. First is uh, the planning committee. Uh, the members of the planning committee, uh, I think, uh, helped immensely in putting together the program that you have, and I'd, I'd like to single out especially for that Hudson Janish. Without his participation, I think this program would have been much less than it was. Uh, s <laughs> Secondly, I think we, we have to thank the speakers. I've been listening to stories about the tribunal from hell for the past few days, and it seems to me that what we attempted to do in, this, in, in putting together the special lectures was find the best people we could uh, working within the topics, the, the jurisdiction we gave them, and, and simply leave them their heads. And in fact, what, that's what we did. And, and I'd say that if this, this program has been as successful as I, I think it was, it's, oh, it's, oh, it's, it, that fact is owed to the quality of the presentations from the speakers and the commentators. And Dennis and I would like to thank all of them as well. And, and that includes Bob Reed. <laughs> I had to get back at him for that. Um, and, and finally, I, I don't think we can <laughs> close this session, sorry about that, without thanking the, the staff of the uh, Continuing Legal Education Department of the Law Society of Upper Canada, all of them for, for the work that they did. And in particularly, I'd like to single out Brenda Duncan, the director of, of that department, and Kathy Stolarchuk for their efforts in putting together this conference. And, and finally, again, thank you all very much. <laughs>